Hello everybody, my name is Jamie Foster and I'm a professor at the University of Florida. In this presentation, which is part of a series put forth by the American Society of Gravitational and Space Research to help support the upcoming decadal survey in biological and physical sciences in space. So in this specific presentation, I want to talk about how we can put microbes to work for us for long duration spaceflight. Specifically, not only do we want to monitor microbes as their communities are changing on different spacecraft under different environments, but how could we potentially use microbes to almost act as a probiotic uh, for the entire space station or what I'm calling the probiome. So in this short little presentation, I will talk about some of my forward thinking ideas about how we can look at the built environment of spacecraft and use microbes and put them to work to help protect crew and missions, whether that be in low Earth orbit, towards the moon, or maybe even to Mars. So before we go too far down the rabbit hole, let's define some terms that I'll be using a lot in this little presentation. And the first is the built environment. You've probably heard that term quite a bit. And we're talking about whether it's your home, your kitchen, or a spacecraft. It's structures that human humans build and where we spend a lot of times. Really over the last you know 150 200 years humans have become an indoor species. We spend 90 percent of our time indoors and the same will be true for astronauts. They are going to be whether they're inside a spacecraft, inside a spacesuit, inside a habitat, they are going to be spending all of their time inside and then that means we have to think about all the microbes that are on the surfaces, whether it's our, again, it's our house, or all the nooks and crannies of a spacecraft, whether that's a human being, we do carry around, we are meta communities carrying around our microbes, and we're leaving behind them all in the space environment. And so that becomes very important for us to look at the microbiome of that built environment here. And that's not only the living viable organisms, but it's also the genetic material, the proteins, the dormant cells that are kind of left behind or just residually left over. And these may be impacting humans. So it's very important to holistically think about the microbiome of any built structure. So that leads to some really key questions that must be answered for long duration spaceflight missions. Like what microbes are the crew or people being exposed to in these kinds of indoor settings in a space habitat? What are the factors that are controlling microbial abundance, diversity, and persistence? And what are the effects these microbes might be having on human health? Maybe it's also plant health or animal health as we have longer duration missions. Or maybe we even have to worry about microbes degrading the building materials. You know, we, and we can have lessons learned from former missions like Skylab here or shuttle or even what's going on the ISS. And hopefully that will inform us about the type of materials, the type of conditions that we need to have for future space missions. So for us to really learn what the dynamics are with a microbiome in a built environment, we can look to a lot of studies done on Earth, whether that's in the average US home or in um, a hospital room, that can tell us a lot about the dynamics within a microbiome of a built structure. So for example, a few studies, here's one that was done a few years ago on the average human home where they just looked at the door trim in, your, in this home and they found over 7,000 bacterial OTUs. Now an OTU stands for Operational Taxonomic unit. It's kind of the microbiology equivalent of a species. So 7,000 bacterial species and 2,000 fungal species just in the door frame, suggesting that the average U.S. home is very rich in biological microbial diversity. The same can be true for hospital rooms. Here was a study done on a NICU unit uh, looking at the microbial communities associated with a hospital room and they found 12,000 different bacterial species within this room and interestingly the room changed so if a new occupant took over that hospital room within 24 hours or so the room started to look like the microbial diversity of that occupant, suggesting these microbiomes are very dynamic and can change based on who is there in that environment. And it really is true that the humans are driving the shape of 
of the typical indoor environment. And it can be millions of copies of bacterial genomes per our person per hour that are being contributed to the environmental air system. And these in these particular um, studies, these were some of the common microbes associated with those studies. But it is unclear how many of these species or taxa are viable. And most of the studies are using DNA metagenomics. This is a way where you're capturing all the DNA from all the genomes of all the microbes in that environment. So it's kind of telling you your genetic potential or the metabolic potential of that environment, but it's not always informing you about who is active and who is actually metabolizing in those environments. So that would suggest that other techniques, not just surveys of the DNA, but other techniques have to be incorporated to look also at activity of microbes on a regular basis. So this leads to a very important question of how do building characteristics, including the occupants of those buildings, and their behaviors influence the indoor microbiome. And specifically for spaceflight, what are the mechanisms by which exposure influences health and disease? And the bottom line seems to be that the more diverse the microbial environment is, that seems to be associated with health. And for example, in a study done where they took children from rural environments and urban environments and kids exposed to household dust that lived near farms or were, were living on farms had significantly lower risks of developing diseases like asthma compared to children not exposed to farming environments. They were able to replicate this with mice model systems in which they take farm derived dust and it showed that it was protective from esosinophilia. And so the, some of the key taxa associated with that were bacteroidetes and firmicutes, suggesting that in this case certain taxa that were protective, giving a protective function against certain uh, immune-related responses. This also was true for people who live with pets. Animal-associated microbes offer some of the most effective protection against certain allergies and asthma. And also they took mice and sensitized them to Lactobacillus johnsonii, which is derived from dogs, and that gave um, mice some protection from allergy allergen challenges. So here's a case where again the type of microbes in your environment and the diversity of those microbes can be correlated with health and can promote health. So using some of the knowledge we've learned from tracking microbiomes of built environments here on earth, we've taken the first steps towards starting to track the microbial diversity in communities of spacecraft, in particular the International Space Station. So NASA and several institutions have begun projects like this example microbial tracking project here on the ISS to really start to get a foundational knowledge of what is the basic microbiome of the space station and how does it change as crew members come and go whether it's taking swabs of different parts of the space station or aerosol samples. Tracking the different nodes and parts of the space station here is critical to understand the full range and the full dynamics of the microbiome of the International Space Station. And if you want to learn more, here's a nice website for you to look at the members of those of this team that is looking at these different environments and they're generating great data about how and reproducible data if you want to dive into some of the research here but they're showing a very complex picture of what the microbiome looks like and generating numbers of what is just there and how it's changing and here's a picture of astronaut Jack Fisher swabbing a certain part of the spacecraft and it's giving us some really real-time information about how these communities are changing spatially as well as temporally across uh, the station. And already also some newer technologies for real-time monitoring like MinION are just starting to be used now. So this represents a critical first step in really understanding let's start tracking what microbes are there but how do we take this beyond? Where, what is the next step? And I would argue that the next step beyond basic monitoring of the microbiome of spacecraft is we need fully autonomous microbial surveys. 
we need to merge artificial intelligence, just like the little Simon robot that has flown on the space station. We need to merge that with cutting edge microbial sequencing techniques, such as the Voltrax from Nanopore, which you can just literally insert and run gels and get DNA sequencing through a very, it's kind of one-stop shopping here for DNA sequencing. So we need to merge these technologies to allow aut autonomous, real-time monitoring of spacecraft, especially for Gateway, where humans will not be there on a regular basis. So we can allow these robots to screen, swab, take aerosol samples, and monitor the microbiome of, say, Gateway or any spacecraft over time and regularly stream that information back to Earth. I think this is a very doable uh, technology that could be developed over the next 10 years. So my suggestion is that we need to go take the next step after tracking. Uh, it's just not enough to track what microbes are changing in response to crew rotations or crop rotations um, on these different habitats or after every mission. I think the next step in microbiome or of the built environment is to use beneficial environmental microbes to control opportunistic pathogens in the space environment. If you look at the criteria and the guidelines for the upcoming Gateway mission, there seems to still be this concept that microbe, microbes should be controlled or minimized. We need as few microbes as possible on spacecraft. And I would argue it's not the biomass that's important, it's the biodiversity that's important. And if you can control the toxa that are there, you can control the health of that microbiome of that built environment and by default the health of the crew. So my idea here is that we can use biodiversity intervention. Basically take microbes from the environment and shape the microbiome of spacecraft. And there's some evidence on Earth to support that concept. In a study that came out in late 2020, and here's a link to that study in Finland, uh, they brought in forest soil to a daycare center and put it around the grounds of the daycare center and allowed the students interact with that soil. Within one month of within the daycare center, the immune system of the kids were get, was getting stronger. So we have the ability to maybe control and shape the microbes that are present in a spacecraft environment. So I think that what we need to do is start to have a paradigm shift in our thinking about the role of microbes on spacecraft. I think we have traditionally thought of microbes as something negative, uh, something that is causing disease, but I think we need to start to bring the forest with us and, and use it as a microbial intervention because microbes can play a protective and preventative role in disease. Humans are the major source of microbes found in the built environment for good or for bad. Those human associated microbes are changing the landscape of the microbiome of spacecraft. So if we can tr transition our understanding from biomass control, like using bleach and different compounds to scrub away all the microbes in our environment, and transition to think about biodiversity control, and maybe not worry so much about how many colony forming units, but worry more about what are the colony forming units, what are the species that are present there. And maybe I'm not proposing that we spray down the walls with uh, probiotics, but I am suggesting that maybe by having more plant habitats or having more controlled soil samples in the environment, we might be able to use that to serve as an intervention and protect the human crew from opportunistic pathogens. So again, just to recap the major ideas that I'm trying to present to you that I think we need to think about over the next 10 to 15 years for microbiology in the space environment is I think we need to constant to improve our monitoring techniques. I think we need more artificial intelligence here to automatically monitor the environments, whether it could be the spacecraft robotic monitoring, or maybe we're automatically uh, monitoring the microbiome of inside the astronaut. But I think that more automation has to happen with the microbiome tracking program.
And the second big concept is that we need to transition our, or really have a paradigm uh, change in our thinking that microbes are always bad. We need to move away from just getting our biomass numbers down and focus more on what are the diversity numbers and start maybe even using uh, environmental microbiome to shape the indoor microbiome of spacecraft and help potentially through inoculations, whether it's uh, more plants and the, and their associated microbes in the soils or doing other factors to, to help control microbial diversity and species content to ultimately improve the health of crew during these long duration missions. So of course I'm using this to be provocative and hopefully spur some discussions over the next few months as we develop the decadal survey and don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. Again, my name is Jamie Foster from the University of Florida and thank you so much for listening.